It's like you're en route to somewhere. You're on the way to work or on the way to another important appointment. No, I'm on my way to work, which is an important appointment. But I'm on my way to uh, to work. Running a few minutes behind today. Yeah, all right. Probably did some extra work at the gym, Phil. Uh, a little bit. That's good. How's the back? It's good. It's good. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm a young man again for, <laughs> for the time being. Well, that's a plus. All right, uh, Phil. Before we get into uh, the markets. Uh, these are not your father's Pittsburgh Steelers. I know Bill and John were looking forward to the football discussion here, uh, but the Bye. roster changes have been magnificent. Yes, they have. And, you know, if you step back and look at every single thing that's gone on to this point, other than wide receiver, I can't see a position that isn't better than what it was last year, in particular the quarterback room. I can't get over them getting Russell Wilson and Justin Fields for the amount of money that, that they had to spend to get them. It's also got to be the cheapest quarterback room in the NFL. <laughs> and while I wouldn't say that either one of them moves the needle as far as their hopes for a Super Bowl, but if you put them both together, you know, that increases your ceiling and increases the floor. So if one of them do poorly, you know, I'm assuming Wilson's going to be the starter. If he does poorly, having Justin Fields come in as your backup – isn't it too daggone shabby? And I, I couldn't be happier with what they got, got accomplished in the offseason. Uh, the middle linebacker, Queen, is a top-level middle linebacker to go along with T.J. Watt and Highsmith. And then if some of those other middle backers come back healthy, uh, any of them, Holcomb or you know, Landon Roberts had a good season last year. So I think the Pittsburgh Steelers are looking pretty good going into next year. And – I like the kind of the attitude that this quarterback room is moving forward with. I, as I understand, Justin Fields requested to go to Pittsburgh. He didn't request to go to Pittsburgh thinking he's going to be the starter. He requested to go to Pittsburgh because Russell Wilson's at the end of his career and he wanted to step back and learn from him and be in the Pittsburgh culture. So really, really, it's apparently Kenny Pickett didn't want to be anymore. So uh, really happy with what they what they got accomplished in free agency. Omar Khan is the man. I don't know how he get, pulls this stuff off, but he's done it time and time again. And uh, by the way, NCAA tournament uh, March Madness begins soon. My Dukes go in as an 11 seed. Duquesne made the NCAA tournament for the first time since 1977, and they'll play BYU. This is a year where Duquesne is in the NCAA tournament and Pitt and West Virginia are not. Something's gone really odd in the world. <laughs> it's, it's just completely weird now. Uh, hey, let's move on to money. Phil? Uh, because uh, futures markets this morning are looking up. The Dow is up 78. S&P futures are up more than three-quarters of a percent. NASDAQ futures are up over 220 points this morning. If we are fearing inflation and uh, not expecting as many or even maybe any interest rate cuts uh, based on uh, what's been going on with the recent numbers, Phil, why are tech stocks up so much? Well, it could just be a bounce because tech stocks have struggled of late, uh, in particular the Magnificent Seven, so they have struggled of late, kind of baking in a slowdown from the Federal Reserve or more uh, a, a strong position that they're not going to cut rates anytime soon. And what is baked in, and it's important that we all understand, you know, if we go back to December, uh, there was a, a perception that the markets were, were assuming six rate cuts for 2024. And then the data that came out in January, February, and so far this month, they said, no, 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 we're not going to be able to do that. Inflation is, isn't as low as what we had hoped. So we had peeled that back to three. However, last week's CPI and PPI number may even damage that a little bit more. So I think that's why last week was we kind of struggled last week, especially the, the growth companies struggled. So what he says after uh after the Fed meeting is going to be really important. Does he? Is there any indication? Now, I know what he's going to say. It's data dependent. But does he open the door? And I don't, I don't think this is the case. So I don't want to make it sound like I think that this is going to happen. But because of the, the path of inflation, does he open the door for rate increases yet again? I don't think he would do that. But if he did, that would be terrible for our market. Or does he go along with the, the mindset that, yeah, we think rate cuts are – going to happen this year we're just not quite sure how many right now the assumption is three but that timeline keeps getting pushed out you know it went from march in december we thought it was going to be march and then in the early months of this year we thought it was going to be june and now they're pushing it out to july some even think maybe even 
September. So that, that number keeps getting pushed out. So it's when will the rate cuts come and how many will there be for 2024 and what indication will Jay Powell give us on Wednesday to what to expect for that moving forward? The uh, article I'm reading right now on CNBC, Phil, says that Fed funds futures are currently pricing in a 99% likelihood the Fed will leave the benchmark interest rates unchanged this week. And the expectation for a June cut has ticked down in recent days to just 55%. Yes, and it, it, I, I would be absolutely stunned if they uh, did anything with rates at this meeting. Either way, it, especially uh, increase on, but they're, they're certainly not going to decrease rates after these last two inflation readings, the three really, to count January, the, the last few inflation readings. But uh, that, that June number used to be up in the 70s and 80s. Uh, before last week, it was over 60. Now it's barely over 50. And I anticipate that after he talks on Wednesday, it's going to be below 50 and it's going to shift out to July. Billy? Yeah, uh, good morning, Phil. Uh, what's happening in the energy sector? Uh, natural gas prices are, are not an all-time low, but the lowest they've been in uh, uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, some of the... Uh, uh, energy, lithium, and the like are hitting rock bottom. What's happened to the energy sector in total? Now, and before you answer that, let me also mention the fact that natural gas is up almost 5% this morning. Go right ahead. You ruined it, Bill. The, uh, <laughs> Bill spoke too soon. <laughs> it's, well, still, it's, it's still pretty it's cheap, still, though. still cheap. Yeah, yeah. still cheap. It's still, it's still inexpensive, but it, any, and we look at energy as cyclical, and it is based off of uh, supply and demand. So at the levels that they are right now, and you know, I always focus on gas because that's what hits all consumers is, is at the pump. So that's the main focus when we look at energy. But it's cyclical, and until it gets beyond a certain range, it's a moot point to the market. Oil, however, is at $81.5 a barrel. And when you look around town, I'm seeing uh, th the return of $3.5 gasoline prices, 3 and a half bucks a gallon. Phil, and um, that's been going up, not coming down. Yes, and I would imagine it's going to continue to go up because we're getting into that part of the season where travel is more prevalent. People are starting to purchase airline tickets and plan travel for the summer and some holidays coming up in Easter and, and all of that being cyclical. So it is in that range where it's a moot point to the markets until it exceeds you know, with the price of oil anyway, until it exceeds over $100 a barrel, it's kind of a moot point to the overall markets. I want to ask you. That's why there's one of these. Yeah, we, and we, you know, speaking of that, and, and to tie it in with inflation, there's a, on the CPI and the PPI, there is one that strips out the price of the more volatile in, energy. So, you know, as that ties into that, there's always two numbers that they give us. One includes energy and food, and one excludes energy and food and there's a bigger focus on the one on the inflation reading that excludes energy and food and i've always found that to be interesting because that's a part of the it's a huge part of the inflation narrative but the the uh the the mindset that those two are so volatile it's hard to predict and it's hard to price in and make any movements off of it because of the volatility the more focused on inflation reading is the one that doesn't include energy and food yeah, and, and those are also the two biggest expenses for most people. For, yeah. You know, not counting your mortgage or whatever, but of the money you have left over to spend that you're not spending on rent and insurance and whatever, it's food and gasoline. And, and there, and those two, energy and food, are so closely tied together as well. You know, how much does it cost to get our food to and from somewhere for us in order to purchase it? You know, we used to use bananas and so forth as an example, but somebody's got to get that to the grocery store or get it to your front door you know in the world to, we live in today get it to your front door and part of that expense is is the price of gas or price of energy a hey, secure act 2.0 phil in regards to roth 401ks and the employer's matching part of it so i was talking to my son yeah. this week who has a 401 a roth 401k basically is how it works uh but the employer contribution is traditional, whereas his contribution is Roth. When when does that change that Secure Act 2.0 made kick in that allows that to be also a Roth contribution from the employer? It's available now, but it, the employer can elect to do it or not to do it. 
Um, and, and we think this is a huge part of Secure Act 2.0, and I think it will take some time. So, number one, the plan sponsors have to have the ability to allow you to do that. And in most cases, unless it's a, a, a huge 401K plan, in most cases it's probably going to take some some uh, noise from the employees to say, hey, we want this available to us so that your contributions can go in as Roth as well. But right now it's available, but most plan sponsors, uh, and actually I haven't seen any yet, uh, any plan sponsors that have adopted it and employers that have elected to allow that or the plan sponsors that have elected to allow that. So right now I haven't seen any of it, but it is available now just the ability to do so. Also with Secure Act 2.0 is a small employer SEP and simple contributions that can go to Roth, whereas before it couldn't. But there's something to remember, and I know we still think it's a great idea for a lot of people, but on the employer contribution side, you have to remember that you're going to receive some sort of phantom income with that. So just for simple math, if your income were to be 100000 and your employer was contributing 4% on your behalf right now that has no impact on your on your taxes at the end of the year but if you elect to say hey I want that to go to the Roth side so I'll go ahead and pay taxes on it now so I don't have to worry about it later if you elect for that to go onto the Roth side you're now going to be taxed on 104,000 even though you didn't receive that that's essentially saying, hey, we paid you, and we went ahead, and, and now you're responsible for the taxes on it now, so you won't have to be later. So you call that what you will. I've been calling it phantom income, but but that that's something that people need to remember as that becomes starts to become available, and hopefully it's sooner rather than later. But we have seen some some slowdown with this uh, with employers allowing that or electing that for their employees. I would call it deferred income as opposed to phantom income, Phil. Well, it's not deferred because you're paying taxes on it right now. So well, it's, it's, uh, but you're not receiving the income yet. That's why it's phantom. That's why I like to call it deferred. <laughs> you're, you're paying taxes. <laughs> you're you're deferring that deferred. income down the line. You're not. You're paying taxes on it now, so it's not deferred. But you're going to get – how about deferred growth? You argue everything. Because no. <laughs> you're not going to get that until you're 59 and a half years old paying, at the earliest. You're paying taxes on income that you're not receiving right now. So they're, you're paying taxes on something that doesn't exist, therefore the phantom. Well, so it, it, it exists when you're 59 and a half, though. We're talking about the same thing. So if you want to call it deferred, <laughs> that's great. I'll accept it. I'll call it phantom or ghost or whatever you like. But if you want to call it deferred, you can. All right. I'll call it deferred. You call it phantom. Mr. It. We're talking about the same. We're still yeah. on the same page. We are. Yeah. Mr. Gilstrap, have you anything for Mr. McCoy? <laughs> That's more like a discussion that normally happens among my friends group, you know, about words. What What should it be? You know, no, that's the you wrong word. That's an adverb. No, that shouldn't be that way. <laughs> You just heard our conversation every morning at about 6.30 when we call. That's the, that's the stuff we talk. It sounds like a Seinfeld episode. But we, we think the same way. We just call it different things. It's a show about nothing. Um, early on in the conversation, we are talking about um, tech stocks are, are doing uh, really good things. All right, so we have Congress overwhelming, or the House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed this TikTok bill to uh, the TikTok either is illegal in the United States or China has to... Um, uh, divest itself and resell it, whatever they have to do. And the Supremes have taken up a number of cases that look like it's going to fundamentally change the face of social media, probably with some form of government regulation that didn't exist before. What's your feel of the effect on the tech stock markets, particularly the big boys, Meta and, and, and the others, if these things come through? Is this, are, is this going to ruin the um, the 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 market for these for these stocks. I don't think it, I don't think it would ruin it, and I'll narrow down the, the tech stocks to social media stocks, whether okay. it's Twitter or X or Facebook. I do think it could have some impact on those guys, especially Facebook, that is part of that magnificent seven. So it could have some impact on that. Now I've heard arguments both ways, and I think both of them are very valid and and, and well laid out. But one argument is is if you put these restrictions on 
uh, TikTok, that that could increase the usage of Facebook and maybe drive some younger users that may have profiles now, but they don't use them. You know, all these high school and college age kids, they have Facebook. They just don't really use it. They're more on other platforms of social media. And I, to be honest with you, I, I have a hard time keeping up with them because they change so often that TikTok is one of those. So if they put re- uh, restrictions on them or do away with TikTok in the United States altogether, that could drive users to use Facebook more often and therefore help Facebook. But on the other hand, just like you had mentioned, and it's kind of the way that I think as well, is if they start introducing restrictions on social media that it could injure those companies where their ad revenue may not be as strong. And that's where the, the majority of the revenue is coming from is ad revenue. I mean, even even if you look at your own stuff, you, you could probably trace back a lot of our purchases if you're a Facebook user. You can trace back a lot of your purchases to Facebook and clicks, and that's how they get paid. So restrictions on that could damage it. And then I've heard the argument that says, hey, it's going to offset. It's going to drive some more users to it, but future restrictions or further restrictions on social media would slow down some of that ad revenue. However, they're going to have it would drive more revenue because of users to Facebook if TikTok's gone. So the the end result is if that passes, I don't really know what it does to it. On one hand, I think it could help. On another hand, I think it could hurt. And typically when that's the case, it's a moot point and it keep, the, the company continues to profit as it has. Meta has been a, a absolute superstar in the past year or so because of because of ad revenue. Uh, Phil, kind of along the same lines, uh, uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, right now, the, there's very few regulations, and the, uh, uh, so cryptocurrency is kind of running amok or, or collapsing one of the two. Uh, what should we do? How do we handle something like cryptocurrency? Well, with cryptocurrency for us, you know, we, we talk about this often with clients and, and, and the likes, but cryptocurrency at, at the moment – we don't really see a place for pure cryptocurrency in long-term financial planning and as far as, hey, I want my money to grow to get to this. Now, we'd be silly to ignore its recent growth, and it has had recent growth. Um, and I think, has it reached an all-time high? I think it did. I think it touched an all-time high and then came back down. But simply because of finding an intrinsic value for cryptocurrency, you're unable to do that. So, therefore, it doesn't fit because of the risk-reward scatterplot. However, there are a few places that you can go to get exposure to cryptocurrency, whether it's Coinbase or the platform that it trades on. And now there's exchange trade of funds uh, where you can get access to cryptocurrency. So if it's to be included in your portfolio, our recommendations anyway, or is it be a really, really small piece of your overall allocation and to obtain uh, exposure to it, not directly from Bitcoin or Dogecoin or any of those, but to gain uh, exposure to it from a company like Coinbase. So at least you can get an intrinsic value for it. But by, by and large, you know, if someone says, well, why? Why don't you guys want that in your portfolios? Well, one is because you can't obtain a, a, an intrinsic value for it. How do you break it down and say this is what it's worth? What if that company goes out of business? Not really a company. What if it goes out of business? What can they sell? What's the value of their assets? The other part, and you know, go, going back to this regulations thing, let's look back when China put regulations on cryptocurrency and what it did to the overall price. Could you imagine if that happened in the United States, what would happen to the value of cryptocurrency? It could go either way. It's like, hey, we've made it more legitimate because we've placed regulations on it. But what if those regulations are very strict by way of taxes or how much of it someone could purchase and who can trade it and, and the report the reporting of it, and et cetera? So, and, and its exposure to or its regulations from FINRA or the SEC, right now those things don't exist uh, as far as regulations are concerned. So if those are placed on cryptocurrency, it, on one hand it could legitimize it, but on the other hand, it could absolutely cripple it, much like it did when the regulations came from China. I don't think that you can right now view cryptocurrency anywhere near you can, uh, the way you'd look at the dollar or anything else that has a, a value underneath it of some sort. Uh, because first and foremost, when you spend a dollar, you don't get taxed on what its current value is compared to the exactly. the euro. I, I mean... It, it's a it's a tax nightmare to try to deal in cryptocurrency. 
because you've it got the, you've got the price of whatever you're buying exactly. plus the appreciation of the crypto since the time you acquired it. If you had to do that with every dollar you spent, it would be a tax nightmare. That's it kind of, would be a nightmare. That's kind of the root of my question. Can it be regulated? Yes, it, absolutely it can be regulated, whether it's a tax-as-you-go sort of thing. And, you know, there's there, they've we've thrown that out, or it's been thrown out for even stocks and so forth, where you're – you're kind of shoring up tax-wise as you earn uh, money on on stocks at the end of the year or on a quarterly basis. This has been thrown out there a lot of different ways, but you could, you know. So if I had exposure to a cryptocurrency that doubled in value, then I'm immediately taxed on that. You know, now I, I, the mere purchase itself doesn't cause the taxation. The growth of it causes the taxation. Now you look at a non-qualified stock that's not sitting inside of a retirement plan, uh, uh, IRA or a Roth or a 401k, if you look at a stock or a mutual fund, if you sell that and you don't take the money, it's like, hey, I'm just going to sell it and buy something else with it, you're taxed on it immediately. It's not the receiving of the money that is the taxable event. It's the liquidation of that actual uh, 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 stock or mutual fund that creates that. But in form of, and that's how Bitcoin works right now. But if it were to grow in real time, you say, hey, when it grows, you're, you're responsible for that tax immediately, whether you sell it or not. That may make it easier to use for purchase, but it may also make people shy away from it because then they can't control the taxes on it. Yeah, Bitcoin wants to be treated like cash, but it's really more equivalent to a stock certificate at this point in terms of how it's it traded. To me, it is. To be taxed. I agree. Yeah, if you paid your rent with a stock certificate, you'd have to – pay the appreciation of the tax on the on the amount of the certificate you traded to somebody plus your rent <laughs> if just i mean come on or you would shift that tax obligation over to them and they wouldn't accept it you'd have to give them more than what your rent was right so, so yeah there, there there's certainly some some tax issues to to uh filter through when you're dealing in cryptocurrency uh phil but what, not the individual company like, right uh, you know, if you if you invested directly, say in Coinbase, which has become popular, you kind of control that to to an extent. You know, I'll recognize the taxes when my little heart desires, or when I can afford it, or when I want to liquidate the position. But you you know, right, and and you do the same thing with Bitcoin right now. But if you want to use it as a currency, then you know you, you're you're bound to pay those taxes when you use it. I just want to let you know too, uh, Phil. Nvidia's back up over nine hundred dollars. So just so you know. Did you? <laughs> I'm glad that you're keeping track of it. <laughs> I do. I've been watching it for two years and never buying it. Well, it keeps going up. <laughs> you know, if you didn't buy it and, you, and you're still watching like that, it's phantom game. For you. It's, 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 deferred, it's game. deferred game. Phantom. It's deferred. I'm, I'm deferring any gains I'm going to get on it. Uh, Phil, how do we reach you for more information about what you folks do at the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors there? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Phil, as always, a pleasure to speak with you, sir. Thank you, guys. You guys have a great day.